Hello and welcome to the new Yankee Workshop, Season 16, Episode 10, The Peer Table. A peer table is a small table that is meant to be located between two windows. Norm finds a beautiful example of one at GKS Bush Antiques on Nantucket, Massachusetts, made of poplar and beautifully painted with classic designs and a faux marble top, the original is stunning. Norm builds a copy and has it painted to match the original. Enjoy! Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Today we're going to build a peer table, which, as we learned, is a table meant to go in the space between two similar windows. Now, we found a very rare and expensive antique in Nantucket. It had a faux marble top and a very classic design painted on the base. We'll take you there to take a look at the antique, and then we'll come back here and build our own version of a peer table right here in the New Yankee Workshop. Funding is provided by Well, I've been meaning to come into this shop for quite some time. It's off Old South Road here in Nantucket. It's the creation of Guy Bush, and there's always something interesting in the window. I mean, look at this piece, this beautiful bonnet top, high boy. And look at this voluptuous looking piece. Hey, Norm Abrams, Guy Bush. <laughs> Hi, Guy. Happy hunting. Boy, this is a great place. What can you tell me about this piece? This is a really fantastic Boston Chippendale block den serpentine chest, about 1770, with some of the best OG bracket feet, shaped feet I've ever seen. Oh, it is a beautiful piece, but a little bit too complicated for the viewers of the New Yankee Workshop, possibly. So, uh, what else do you have? Come on, I'll show you. Whoa, check out this weather vane. That is a gigantic arrow and banner weather vane, English, mid-18th century, with the best vertigris patina I've ever seen. Wow, you need to have a trophy house to put something this Indeed large on Indeed you it. do. <laughs> This is a Rhode Island Chippendale secretary desk, mm -hmm. about 1770, mahogany in the original finish mm -hmm. with a waterfall interior and fan carved drawers. What's the secondary wood here? Chestnut, which is, was favored by the Rhode Island cabinet makers. Wow, it's a beautiful piece. I hope you don't touch this original finish. We're not going to take the belt sander to that <laughs> no, you one. better not. Here's one of my favorites. This is a Goddard Townsend Newport Tiger Maple high boy or high chest, about 1730, with this great figured tiger maple. I know, I love the look of the tiger maple. It's just got that nice color and beautiful grain to it. That's a special piece, but way beyond what we're looking for. You got something for the average woodworker? Well, you know, probably the hottest thing right now is painted furniture. I have a really super painted table. Let me show you that. It's over here. So people really are looking for the painted stuff these painted days. Painted furniture and folk art are the hottest things in the Americana field. Really? Ah, yeah. That's a, a very interesting and unusual piece. I've never seen anything like this This is before. a Baltimore painted pier table from mm -hmm. the Federal era, about 1810, with rustic scenes and anthemians painted on an apple green ground. Sort of a faux The original top. faux marble top. All the decoration is original, mm -hmm. and it has this beautiful shape. Seems a bit high, though, to me. Well, it was a southern taste for hospitality and entertaining. People like to mix drinks, so the tables were high at that level for, for drinking. Hmm. Mind if we flip it over so Let's I can see the construction? Sure. Okay. All right. It's made Wait. of tulip poplar. Yeah, nice thick pieces here that have been shaped. And I see a seam right there, so they must have added on some Absolutely wood. Absolutely, to add to the it. shape to make the dramatic shape. Of it. The turning is fairly simple, and the leg is square where it meets these aprons, but there's, a, there's like a turn piece on the corner. Turreted ends. You think they turn that and then split it in half and added it to the definitely, piece? Definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. It's not complicated construction, but it, it makes for such a beautiful shaping. Okay, so the front is also shaped, and the top is secured with some big screws in these screw pockets. Also secured with these original pine glue blocks. Right, so that holds it all together. Great oxidation and patination. Looks it's like, untouched. Looks like the painter cleaned his brush some of the original was decorated. Dabbing. Yeah. Well, you know, I think this is just the thing we're looking for. If you don't mind, I'd like to take a few measurements and maybe some photos. Be my guest. And I'll build one of these. Great. Thanks. Well, here it is, our version of that pier table that we saw in Nantucket. And you'll be happy to know that it didn't cost $125,000. If you have a lathe and a bandsaw, this is an interesting project to build. Now, I made it out of poplar, 
because poplar takes paint well, and it's a relatively stable material. I like the size of this piece, particularly the height. It's about 36 inches. And I can see this in the front hallway as a place to drop off your car keys and mail and your gloves as you come in the door. Now, if you'd like to build your own pier table, a measure drawing is available with the materials list, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now, let me show you how we're going to get started. We have to do a series of glue-ups. Here's some 7 8 inch thick boards for the top. Here are some pieces that I'm going to glue together to make that front apron. These are for the sides. And this is going to get glued up for the turning. And here's a chunk for one of the legs. I'm going to start with the top. Now, I don't have to worry about the texture of the wood because this is a painted project. But I do like to alternate the growth rings to add stability to the top. So in this one, you see them dish down, up, down, and up. And by doing that, the top should stay flatter. Before I can glue it up, I have to treat these edges. They are not even close to joining together. So we'll straighten those over at the joiner. That's the best way to do that. But before we use any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, the most important safety rule is to wear these safety glasses. Now a couple passes should treat that edge. Now those slots are for some number 20 biscuits to reinforce the joints. Let's glue it up. All right, I'll just set this aside to dry for a while. Next, we want to glue up for the apron and the sides. Now, when I looked at the antique original, I noticed that they had also glued up these pieces. The inside is straight, but in order to get this shape across the apron, they glued on some additional material. Now, instead of just gluing a small chunk, I'm gluing on a large piece, and we'll cut it out later. That's next. I'm just using an ordinary yellow carpenter's glue on both surfaces of each piece. Now, this is the long apron, so there's going to be a piece on each end, and we'll clamp that up. Well, now we can turn our attention to making some legs. The legs start out as blanks that are two and a quarter inches square. And what I want to do is remove the material where the turning is going to occur, like this one. So I've laid out the lines where it remains square. And I'll just make a saw cut, and then I'll remove the rest of the material at the bandsaw. <laughs> The reason that I take the time to do this step is that it'll save me time at the lathe. So here at the bandsaw, I've tipped the table to 45 degrees, I cut a corner, rotate it, and go all the way around until I'm done. With the leg centered in the lathe, I'm ready to get started. I like to make a full-size drawing of all the details on the leg. And I'll use that to mark out where the details are located, and I'll also use it to set my calipers so I get the diameters just right. Now, the first step is to make this blank round by knocking off the corners. And to do that, I'm going to start with my gouge. Now, I can't use my gouge to get right up to the transition between the square and the round. For that, I'm going to switch to a skew chisel, make a nice crisp cut right at this edge, and then use my scraper to do the first inch or so. Now it's time for some marks at the various intersections. I'm going to put a mark right here and smooth this area. And then down here, I'm going to put a mark on each side of this flat area and smooth that to the right diameter. Now I'll put on more marks to define the details.
All right, now I want to set this diameter right here, about a half an inch away from that line. Now I'm going to move the tool rest to start to form the taper of the leg, which runs from here to here. Since my tool rest is only 12 inches long, I'm going to do it in two segments. I like to line up the edge of the tool rest with the depth of the cut, make it equal here and here, and you can see the gap is tapered, which means when I run my tool along the rest and guide it with my finger, I'll end up with a taper in the turning. Now the sides of the table and that front apron as well as the back rail are connected to the legs with a mortise and tenon joint. We like to make the mortises first and then fit the tenon to the mortise. My stationary mortiser is the best way to do this. With the legs mortised, I thought I'd set up all the pieces for the base. Here's the front apron. It's out of the clamps and dry, as well as the two side pieces. I've added this piece of three-quarter inch poplar, which is going to be the back rail. The next step is to size these for width and length. With the pieces jointed, I can place that edge against the rip fence, rip it to width, and then join it again. Now here I'm doing step one of forming a tenon on the end of one of these side pieces, which is to nibble away about three-eighths of an inch by an inch on each edge. Now here I'm set up to make the shoulder cut for the tenon. As you can see, I'm only leaving three-eighths of an inch right at this top edge. That's going to be the actual width of the tenon. So I have a stop block which lines me up with the nibbling that I did earlier, and I just slowly and carefully push the piece through. Now, using my tenoning jig, which safely piece, holds the piece upright, I can make the cheek cut, and that completes the tenon. Okay, now let's see how everything fits together, and then we'll be able to do some more layout. Okay. That fits great. Now I want to make some marks where the end of the apron meets the leg post, as well as here. And I want to number each intersection so that every time I put it back together, I match the same pieces. There's one more thing I want to do before I leave the shop tonight. If you look at this corner, you can see that there's a turning that wraps around the square part of the post. So what I want to do is take a piece of stock that I've glued up to be about two and three quarters inches thick and cut out this V in the middle by tipping my blade at 45 degrees. That allows room for the post. Now let's cut it in half. Now see where I'm going here? If I take a piece of stock that represents the square part of the leg and insert it in there, it wraps it perfectly. But how am I going to turn just half a piece? Now if I were to glue the two pieces together, like this, and insert this in the lathe, I could turn, I could make the turning, but how do I get it apart? And here's the tip. If I apply glue to the wood on each side where it's going to join together, and then stick a piece of paper in between. It'll be held together, strong enough to do the turning, 
Yet, when the turning is complete, I'll be able to separate the two pieces because the paper will act like a release. Well, we'll let this cook overnight and it'll be ready for turning tomorrow. And we'll also easily finish our project. Good morning. We should easily finish our pier table today. I've got the prototype here because I want to show you how the base connects to the top. I'm using a technique that's been used for centuries, a pocket and a screw, in this case, a pocket screw. Now, in the antique, it was carved out with a chisel, but we're going to use a jig, this pocket hole jig. I set it on the location and just clamp it in place. Now, to drill the hole in the pocket, I'm using this step drill. It has a 3 8 inch portion here and about an eighth inch portion here. The large portion will make the pocket. The tip will make the through hole for the screw. Just slide it in the jig and drill it. I found that it's much easier to do this work before the sides are shaped on the bandsaw. That's all there is to it. Well, now it's time to lay out the shape of the apron and the sides. I have this quarter-inch plywood template that I trace, aligning it with the back edge. I just flip it over and I do the other side. I made a similar template to take care of the side pieces. Now, you'll notice that some of these lines are straight and some of them are curved. I want to cut the straight lines at the table saw because I'll get a more crisp cut. I'm going to make the 45 degree angle cuts on the ends first, so I've tipped the saw blade 45 degrees. I'm going to use my miter gauge to guide it through. Now we're going to switch to the other angle, which is 22 and a half degrees. Now it's just a matter of cutting the curved sections here at the bandsaw. Now it's time to start dressing those cuts that I just made. I like to start by using my oscillating spindle sander, and I like to start with the largest drum for the radius that I'm working with. And since this radius is fairly flat, I'm using a four inch drum. But if you notice where the step is, I can only come in to there. I don't want to nick this corner. So this part I'll have to do with a smaller drum. And even at that, there'll be some hand work later on. Now we're ready for some glue up. And what I like to do is subassembly. So this is the back legs and the back rail. I'll do the front legs and the front rail, and then we'll join those together with the sides. Okay, everything still fits. Now I've situated the base on the top and I'm attaching it with these pocket screws. And they're a little bit different than a regular screw. They have a self-tapping tip and instead of having a wedge under the head, it's actually flat, which allows the screw to suck the pieces together better. And this one happens to be a square drive. I use coarse thread on softwoods, fine thread on hardwoods. Let's take another look at the prototype. On the corners, I have these turnings that wrap around the square part of the leg. Now, you might recall that, that yesterday I glued together some pieces with paper in between that I'm going to turn. The next step is to cut the piece the correct height, and I'll do that at the table saw.
I'm going to stick this block of wood, which is equal to one of the corners of the leg through, and it has a center mark, and that'll allow me to take this compass and draw a circle so that I can remove as much material as possible before I go to the lathe. Now I've mounted the whole assembly in the lathe, but to prevent the blank from sliding, I'm going to drive in a couple screws, and uh, they'll be far enough away from the tool so there won't be any problem. Now let's check it for balance. It's not too bad. Now with my gouge, I'll round it over. Okay, that looks good. Now let's take it over to the bench and split it in half. Now I'm just taking a chisel, getting it right on that joint where the paper is. Let's see if I can split this in half. Here it goes. Now it's amazing that the glue on each side of that piece of paper will hold it together while I turn it, yet I can easily pull it apart to get two halves. Well now with the paper scraped off of the joint, I can apply a bit of glue. Drop it on over the corner of the leg and secure it with a couple brads. All right. Well, I think this project is ready for the finishing room. Well, here it is, our completed pier table. And I must say I can take no credit for this beautiful paint job, which is very close to the antique original. The work and the credit goes to Natalie Gardner, who's a decorative artist. She came in and first painted the piece green and then using a variety of other colors. She did these classic detail uh, elements as well as some scenic pieces. And then she did the top in a lighter marble than that antique original. And I think she was right in doing that. We like this look. Now the difficult thing for her to do was to take what looked like a brand new piece and distress it to give it some age, take away some of the paint that she put on. But I think she did a fabulous job. It is a beautiful piece. And I think I have just the right pair of windows to set this table. Now let me show you what I'm gonna build next time. We call it an extension dining table. It's four feet wide and nine feet long when it's fully put together with two leaves. And that should comfortably seat at least 12 people. Now it's made out of solid mahogany. The top is about an inch thick. And it sits on two Queen Anne pedestals with rolling casters. If you'd like to build your own extending dining room table, join us next time right here in the New Yankee Workshop. Funding is provided by Thank you for watching. For more, please like and subscribe.